This week's Parshiot are Bahar Bukhukotai. Today is uh, just uh, yesterday was the 37th day of the counting of the Omer. So for those who have not yet counted, we'll follow it up uh, using that, that method. <clears throat> it seems like it's the divine will that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should place for our, our Torah readings uh, of the month of ER, which inevitably involve Parshat Emor, Bahar, Bechukotai, those three parshiot, which conclude the third book of the Torah, Vaikra. It is at this time every year, between Pesach and Shavuot, that Jews for centuries have read uh, these parshiot. And many of the mitzvot which are given seem to have had back, back then relatively little application as they applied to the mitzvot hatluyot ba'aretz, those mitzvot which uh, themselves are, are dependent upon living on the land or the soil of Israel. For centuries, so few, so few Jews could live there. When the Ramban came to Yerushalayim um, in the year uh, 1264, he said that there, were bar there was barely a minion in the city and they had to even commission the purchase of a Sefer Torah from Tzfat, way up north. So, of course, for Jews throughout the centuries, living in Eretz Israel was certainly a dream. The mitzvot of Eretz Israel and being able to fulfill them um, on the holy land of Eretz Israel, uh, that was a dream. But now, in the last seven decades, we have been blessed with the, the, uh, the state of Israel. We've been blessed with uh, Yom Yerushalayim, the day upon which Jerusalem was liberated from the Jordanian occupation. That, by the way, I would say is the, the only way that we should describe it, that Yerushalayim was liberated from the Jordanian occupation. One of the sad political aspects or sad political realities of our lives is that um, much of the world is bought into the literally to the sheker to the to the to the lie that Israel is the occupier. Israel is not the occupier. The land itself was disputed. Israel has uh, signed documents saying that when peace comes, uh, that we can talk about who will get what when. But unfortunately, that time has not yet come. So it's important to recognize that the, what is called the West Bank or Yehuda and Shomron, uh, as, they are, as we call them, um, are, are sacred territory, sacred land uh, of the Jewish people. And Yerushalayim is the foremost among them. And I mention this, of course, it's sort of political, but it's not really political. It has to do with our religious lives. Uh, I mention this because uh, Right now, uh, in the last couple of weeks, the Yerushalayim itself has come under siege um, by people who in their holy month have decided to, to uh, literally uh, wreak havoc, havoc upon uh, innocent people in the city in the name of a holy month. So tonight we're gonna dedicate uh, this portion of, of, uh, of uh, of the Bahar B'chukotai to the mitzvot that are in Bahar B'chukotai. The two prominent mitzvot that we have at the beginning of Bahar B'chukotai is the mitzvah of Shemitah and the mitzvah of Yovel. The recognition that the land itself is given by God. It is God's land. And we are to be the caretakers of that land. How, are, how do we become the caretakers? We're the caretakers through, the, through doing mitzvot, hatuluyot uh, baaretz, those mitzvot which are identified completely with Eretz Israel, and in fact cannot be um, fulfilled unless we're on the land of Israel. And, um, and, uh, and therefore, we're going to uh, discuss them today because this coming Monday is Yom Yerushalayim. 
Yom Shichrur Yerushalayim, the day of the liberation of Yerushalayim from the Jordanian occupation. Now, uh, it's, uh, I wanna first point out that I ask students wherever, wherever I, I can, uh, certain dates. I ask them what date to the, is uh, the, the day of independence in the United States, and they all can tell you July 4th, if I ask them, students and adults, um, if I ask them, well, what, um, what day do the Christians reckon as uh, the sacred day of the birth of, of uh, uh, the, the, the founder, so to speak, of their faith? And they'll all say December 25th, whether it is or isn't, but that, that's when it's observed. But when I ask people, what day and month, Hebrew day and month, was the city of Yerushalayim, Yerah Kodesh, liberated from the, uh, from the uh, occupation of the Jordanians, very few people can answer. And so I think it's a, it, it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to have this date seared in our memory. Kaf Chet Iyar, Koach Iyar, the 28th day of Iyar, which is this coming Sunday night and Monday. Um, and that would be, uh, it was in the year uh, Tavshin and Chav Zion, 5727, or June the 7th, 1967. But the Hebrew date is, is even more important than the English date. All right, Koachiyar, the strength of the Jewish people was affirmed, and our right to the land and to our holy city were affirmed on that day. And uh, I, I think we have to give an accounting to our Kaddish Baruch Hu to, so that we know those dates, certainly as well as we know the the date of the birth of, of, of other people's uh, religion or their religious authorities. All right, um, my uh, infomercial is over. And what I wanna do is to just spend uh, a little bit of time on, the, on Yerushalayim in, in terms of the Gemara. And the Gemara uses a lot of halachot that were, are taken from our Parsha itself. The Gemara, the Gemara tells us this is a Gemara in uh, Baba Kama, Pei Bet Amud Bet. Asara Devarim Neemru Bi Yerushalayim. There were ten. There were ten halachot. The varim here are generally either halachot or practices or policies. That's why the Gemara uses specifically the term Devarim because it means uh, uh, the, some sort of uh, 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 thing. It could be a mitzvah, it could be a policy, it could be, uh, it could be a law to protect the city. But there are 10, which we're not gonna go through all of them. I'm just going to give you a brief, um, a brief uh, run through of a, a few of them. And he says, Eina bayit chalutba. In Yerushalayim, in, 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 in our Parsha, in Parshat Bahar, the, the Torah tells us that that houses that are in what, well, let's start with the land. The land itself, the land of Israel cannot be, cannot be sold in, its, uh, in perpetuity. As I'm sure many people are aware, uh, when, when the Jews had Nachala and we had divided the various different um, uh, parts of Eretz Israel up among the, the tribes and then among the tribes the various different uh, houses, meaning to say houses of, uh, of families. So if somebody became impoverished and he had to sell his portion, it was not sold in perpetuity. It was sold until Yovel. And then it comes back. It's, the, it's Hashem's land. And it comes back to the person to whom, who represents those to whom it was entrusted. Now, the Torah also tells us that uh, in Eretz Israel, when it comes to houses in walled cities, okay, they, uh, they can be sold in perpetuity. You sell a house like a piece of real estate, so you, you, can, you can sell them. But interestingly, the, the exception is Yerushalayim, Irak Kodesh. Yerushalayim is a walled city. And... Uh, if someone sells his house in Yerushalayim, it is returned to him, just like the land returns to him. So that's called Bait Chalut. 
uh, it, there is no absolute sale of houses in Yerushalayim. The Eina Mediya Eglarufa, as you know, there's another uh, rule, and that is that, that this one is at the end of Sefer Dvarim, that if, a, if a, a man is murdered and we don't know who killed him, and the person himself is either a vagrant or someone who himself is, is, is uh, anonymous. So the rule is that the, uh, the closest city to the, the, the corpse, they measure, literally measure, foot by foot, step by step. The pr- closest city, uh, the leaders of that city are to, are to affirm that they had nothing to do with uh, through negligence and certainly not through intent. To, they had nothing to do with the death of this person. And then they, they have the, the ceremony of the Egla Rufa, where it is, where it is beheaded at, near uh, in an un, uh, untenable field and it, to, re, to represent a, um, an animal which, do, which does not live to its full potential on, on ground, which cannot be, come to complete fruition. And that is a, a stark reminder of the, of the precious nature of life. So, but that doesn't apply to Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, uh, the, the leaders of Yerushalayim do not have to go out. And similarly, uh, Yerushalayim can never become an Irani Dachat, cannot be a, a city which, no matter, um, uh, the rule is a city which uh, is an Irani Dachat, which is overrun with Avodah Zarah, that in itself can lead to its destruction, physically destroy, destroy the, the, the city itself. And the inhabitants and the and the and the possessions uh, would be burned. Hail Olam, the Torah tells us. But that does not apply to Yushalayim. Yushalayim is a special, special place. And its Kedusha sets it apart from, uh, from the general rules of uh, uh, that we find in the Torah regarding cities. Uh, as many of us know, a city and um, a corpse. Someone who, God forbid, dies in Yushalayim is not to, is not to be left overnight in Yushalayim. And there are other such policies that, that were given in terms of mitzvot. Then the Chachomim also added to protect Yushalayim from pollution, air pollution, other pollution, or um, uh, types of industry which would cause soot to go on walls and make, make the city unattractive. Those were banned. Yushalayim is a special city. Ten, ten measures of beauty were given to the world. Nine were taken by Yushalayim, says the, says the uh, Mishnah. So we see that Yushalayim has a, a very, very special place in Jewish life and in Jewish law. Now, Yushalayim, Yehuda Amichai is a... Uh, is considered to be what I guess we would call the poet laureate uh, of Yerushalayim. In, in, in America, we have a uh, uh, poet laureate uh, for they are honored because of their their both their brilliance and their sensitivity. Yehuda Amichai is considered the poet laureate of Yerushalayim. Here's what he writes: Yerushalayim inamal al chof hanetzach. Yerushalayim is a port on the shore of eternity. Such a beautiful phrase. Yerushalayim is a port on the shore of eternity. Because when we go and we see those stones and we, we visit those sacred places, we realize when we stand there, we too, we too are a part of, of eternity. So uh, that in itself also speaks of Yerushalayim's magnificent nature. Now. Chazal tell us that uh, that there are. Uh, in, this is in this is a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. The Mishnah in Avot says as follows: Asara nisim, Asara nisim naasu lavoteinu bevet hamikdash. There were ten specific miraculous elements uh, or events that occurred in Yerushalayim. We're not going to go through the ten. But the last of them is, is intriguing. They're all intriguing. One of them, you, though you, you, many of you may be familiar with, that it said that, that Yerushalayim itself seemed to defy 
um, uh, defy nature in that when they would be in the Beit HaMikdash, they would be standing shoulder to shoulder with no, not, no space between them. Omdim, skufim. But when, umishtachavim liravacha. But when they bowed down, they all managed to bow down. Even though, even though, uh, you know, that takes more space. But Yerushalayim, to, to seem to have defied the laws of nature itself. But in the end, the last of the Nisim, which is stated in the Mishnah and Pirkei Ovo, Perakei, Lo amar adam l'chavero tsar li hamakom she'alin b'Yerushalayim. It says the last of the 10 uh, Nisim and, and um, miracles that were, that uh, as mentioned in the fifth parak of Pirkei Avo, the fifth Mishnah, is no person ever turned to his friend and said, I couldn't find a place to sleep in Yerushalayim uh, during uh, you know, Pesach or Sukkot or Shavuot, which is coming up in the next, uh, within the next few days. Everybody found a place to sleep. Now, that in itself is pretty remarkable because tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews came. And of course, we want to also dedicate, uh, when we talk about large, large numbers of people, um, we want to dedicate uh, this year to the, uh, to the Zikaron of the, the people who were Nifter, it was 45 precious Neshamos, and for a refuah Shalema, to the many people who were injured. So uh, we can get an idea of what it means to be so close together. Although anyone who has seen the videos sees what it is, what it means to be literally shoulder to shoulder. Um, and that happened in, in the base of Mikdash every, every year and during the Shalosh Regalim. So that in itself is uh, remarkable. But the point is, who? Who is being praised here? So some people say the people that are being praised are the very residents of Yerushalayim because they, being the children of Avram Avinu and Sarah Imenu, had their houses open wide for all the people who would come. And so therefore, you would think you wouldn't have a place to, to, to be able to go. You have 100,000 people coming to Yerushalayim? No. Everyone opened their home to Yerushalayim, uh, in Yerushalayim, so the people would never be able to say, I, I, I couldn't find a place. Um, as well, uh, I, I would like to say that this particular statement tells us that the Jews at that time actually defied, uh, defied human nature. Because the, the Mishnah is worded in a certain way. Asara devarim, I'm sorry. Um, um, uh, the Mishnah is wor worded, Velo Amar Adam Lachavero. Nobody ever turned to his friend and told him, Tsarli Amakom, Shalim Bushalim. I couldn't find a place to stay. Uh, I'm thinking that why does it have to say no one ever said to his friend? Just simply, no one ever uh, could proclaim or say or think, I couldn't find a place to live in Yushalayim. But therein is, is the miracle. Maybe some people had difficulty. Maybe they did. But they didn't turn to the person next to them and say, I couldn't find a place to sleep last night. Because inherent within that statement is, if you weren't here, my chances would have been better. But the, the avat Yisrael, the love of the Jewish people, was such during, uh, during the Shalosh Regalim uh, and their time in the Beit HaMikdash, it was such that they uh, that that they they defied human nature. They didn't say it, and uh, and that's one of that in effect that in effect is one of the asara nisim shenasu, one of the ten miracles. Now, Rav Cook, well, for some of I, I want to read you two uh, two brief uh, pieces of uh, modern Israeli. Uh, thinkers. One is Amos Oz, who passed away a couple of years ago. The other is uh, Rav Avram Yitzchak Cohen Cook, who was the first chief rabbi of, of uh, Eretz Israel. Now, each of them talks about 
what the land means to the Jewish people. Because these parshiot, the Amor, Bahar, Bafukotai, all, all focus upon the, the miraculous nature of living in Eretz Israel and, and what the, the Nisim that have to come from it, that Hashem gives three years of, 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 uh, uh, of produce so that we'll be able to, those who are observing the Shemitah year, those people observing it will be able to get through. The, Ibn Ezra says that oh, one, of the, one of the primary elements of the Shemitah year, which is mentioned in this week's Parsha, is uh, that they, since, since the farmer cannot plant, he cannot harvest, what can he do? Of course, there are alternative forms of livelihood. Yes, that's true. But Ibn Ezra says this gives them more time to learn. Uh, learning nurtures the soul just as surely as, uh, as, as the rain nurtures the plants and the soil. So the Jewish people's attachment to the land is deep and profound. I want to read for you first a brief statement by a secular Jew, very, very great writer, Amos Oz, who is considered one of the, one of the great modern Hebrew writers. Here's what he writes, although I'm giving it to you in English. The land of the Jews could not be born, nor could it exist anywhere but on this spot. Not in Uganda, nor Ararat, nor in Birobijan. Now, these are three places that were proposed for the Jews to go instead of Eretz Israel. Because it was to this place that Jews turned their thoughts in every generation. Regarding this, I must make a serious, almost cruel distinction between the internal motivations of the return to Zion and its justification to other people. The yearnings of the generations are motivations, not justification. Political Zionism made a political goal and tool out of the religious messianic yearning, properly so. But our justification as regards the Arab population of the land cannot rely upon our yearnings throughout the generations. What do they care about our, our yearnings? There is no objective justification. Now I'm gonna read it again, this last part, so that, that this is the focus. He claims, there is no objective justification for the Zionist enterprise beyond the right of a drowning man to grab the only plank in the sea available to him. That justification is sufficient. So to a secular Jew, to a Jew who does not feel that, that the land has been given to us to be caretakers by the God who created all the earth. So to him, it is a, uh, the land itself is a safe haven. When times are difficult, we need to be able to come here. He does not deny that we have a right to the land, but our right is not based upon, according to, to Amos Hose, our, li our, our, our right is not predicated upon the mitzvot of Bahar and Bukhukotai, of Yovel and of Shemitah and of Maser and of Truma. But rather, it is, we need a safe haven. Now I'm going to read to you uh, the, from the writings of Rav Kook, he says as follows. Eretz Yisrael is not something apart from, from the soul of the Jewish people. It is no mere national possession serving as a means of unifying our people and buttressing its material or even its spiritual survival. Eretz Yisrael is a part of the very essence of our nation. It is bound organically to its very life and inner being. To Rav Kook, the Jewish people and Eretz Yisrael are not separate entities. Eretz Yisrael, said Rav Kook, is not a possession of the Jewish people. It is part and parcel of our existence. And therefore, he, of course, differs greatly from Amos Oz. If Cook sees Eretz Israel as, as the means for the Jewish people to spiritually fulfill our potential as a people, as a nation, as individuals, whereas Amos Oz views it as Again, a safe haven. You got to be somewhere. This is the logical place. So 
as we uh, as we come close, we're, as we enter upon the sacred day of of uh, Yom Yerushalayim, which is uh, the twenty eighth of ER, we should bear in mind that uh, that this land is not a possession. It is a part of our existence. It is organically bound. That's why Ruth Cook used the term organically bound. Just like my hand is, or, is, I'm an organism and my hand is organically tied to me. So the land of Eretz Israel is organically tied to the Jewish people. Now, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, that's really when Zionism uh, began to really take hold. Uh, Herzl died in the year 1904, and uh, he he was the, the shall we say the prime mover of the secular Zionist movement. But of course, concurrent with it, there was a religious Zionist movement that did not reject Herzl, but saw our return to Eretz Israel not merely as a place of land and language, but rather it is a place where we as Jews, as individuals, and as a nation. Can, can fulfill our, our spiritual destiny. Rav Cook, in, uh, uh, in, I think it was in the 1920s, wanted to start a party uh, uh, with, within, the, within the, you know, the Zionist, there was no government per se, but within uh, the Zionist organization. And he called it Yerushalmi. Um, and he said as follows. Uh, he mentions it in, in the last part of, of uh, Sefer, one, one of his forum here. I, I don't know whether they, they're given each a separate title, but uh, it's in Orot. And he writes that what's the purpose of Zionism? The purpose of secular Zionism is the renaissance of the physical being of the Jewish people, downtrodden, forsaken, Victims in every land that they find themselves, a stranger in every land, and uh, and a citizen in none, and even where they're given citizenship, it is in name only. It is, but not not full citizens with the respect that they deserve. So he said, "What the purpose of of uh, of Zionism is the renaissance of the physical and material life of the Jewish people," and that he said is very important but it is insufficient for our redemption. It's, and again, as oftentimes we've heard in, in college, right? It's a necessary but insufficient uh, uh, element. And it is. Certainly, phys certainly secular Zionism, or now of course we have religious Zionism, but the secular Zionism was a necessary step, obviously part of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plan as well. But Rav Cook said, there is something else. And that is, he started a new movement within the Zionist uh, people. And he says, I'm going to call the, the, the name of my new movement Yerushalmiut. Yerushalmiut. Yerushalmiut, the, the typical uh, creativity of Rav Kook. So, how do they differ? He says, Zionism, of course, tends to the material side, which is necessary, to the physical side, even to the health side of the Jewish people, to be free from pogroms, to be free from the whims of, of dictators and, 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 and murderous mobs. But on the other hand, he said, I want a movement within Zionism that we're going to call Yerushalmi. What is that? Yerushalmi embodies the vision and the values of what Yerushalayim, Ir HaKodesh, stands for. And when we say that Yerushalayim is Ir, Shechub Rava Yachdav, David HaMelech says that in Tehillim, yes, it's true. In 1967, we did. We took two parts of the city, the New Jerusalem, which was under our control, and became united with the Ir uh, Shechub Rava Yachdav. It became united with the, the, uh, the old city, what, they, what other people call East Yerushalayim, but we call the Iratika. It's true. But the Maubim says that what it means there, Shechub Rala Yachtav, is not referring solely to the physical. It's referring to the spirituality. That spirit and material 
and physical become bonded into one. Ir yachtav. Yerushalayim is the city where not only does it have splendor, uh, as Chazal say, in terms of beauty. Beauty takes many forms. More, more often than not, we consider it a beauty which takes the form of, uh, of uh, uh, visual beauty. But says, but said the Malbim on the Pasek, and says, says Rav Kook, Ir Shechubra La Yachtav means to say that it, it bonds together our physical side, our material side, our health side, our spiritual side. All of them become merged into one. That is Yushalayim. And I'll conclude simply by saying that it is the way of people to live in cities. Yushalayim is a city that lives within a people. Wherever we go, wherever we went, no matter the disaster, the plague, the difficulty, we took our Torah with us, our Sidurim with us, and Yushalayim in our hearts. So I wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. And also, this is Shabbos Mavorchim, so we want to make sure that we um, that we you know, remember that. And then Monday, Sunday night, and Monday is Yom Yerushalayim. I wish everybody Shabbat Shalom and Yom Yerushalayim Sameach. Thank you. Welcome. Very welcome. Thank you. Very welcome, everybody. <laughs>